So we we started this series on the Dharma Jewel with um, Sinanata talking about the the Four Noble Truths, uh, which are uh, uh, yeah, which was really the, the the first teaching the Buddha gave uh, after his enlightenment, and um, it's from a, from a text known as "Setting in Motion the Wheel of the Dharma," where the uh, the the Buddha taught uh, the the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, and he also talked about the um, uh, the Eightfold Noble Path. I'm always conscious there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, they, this can all sound very complicated in a way. And um, uh, yeah, they, they can sound like there's lots of different bits to it, but in a way, um, this is, um, this is all an explanation of what the Buddha really saw, which was the um, kind of principle of conditionality, the, the idea that everything arises based on conditions. Yeah, so, so the Four Noble Truths really kind of capture um, the essence of the Buddha's teaching, um, the truth of Dukkha, uh, the cause of Dukkha, the truth of the end of Dukkha and the truth of the path that leads to the end of Dukkha. And uh, so the second of those truths uh, is that Dukkha results from craving and the fourth is that um, we, we need uh, to, to free ourselves from craving uh, we need to transform our experience um, yeah we transform our experience uh, to free ourselves um, from craving and uh, that that is what the April path is it's the the, the path from um, ignorance to awakening and uh, actually could we have the first slide so uh, I just thought I just thought I'd um, yeah I'll try I'll try and summarize this so there, there's a few things here so um, I think that's lovely thank you uh, one way of looking at the Eightfold Path is to look at it in terms of um, ethics, meditation, and wisdom. So we, we, we can look at it against the kind of uh, the threefold path. That we, we, we may be a little bit um, more familiar with. And um, yeah, I can actually looking at this now. I can see I can see the error of my slide, an error on my slide actually. But um, there you go. We'll 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 have to go with that. So last week, um, Steve and Alga talked about uh, right view or perfect view, which of course is the path of vision, and the other seven aspects of the path uh, are the path of transformation. So thank, thanks for that, Stephen uh, Yeah, so anyway, we, the, 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 there's this idea of the two aspects of the path, isn't there? We, we have that kind of initial vision and then there's a kind of process of um, transformation. So one way of saying it, uh, of looking at it is we, we could say the path of vision is uh, the kind of where are we going and then the, the, kind of the, the path of transformation is about how do we get there. And we also talked about the kind of, um, there's a sort of mundane aspect to these uh, and a kind of transcendental path as well. Uh, so uh, when we talk about right, uh, you know, right emotion or, or right vision, we're talking about the, the mundane aspect. But we, we, we cultivate uh, the mundane and that leads us to, leads us to the transcendental. So the perfect vision represents that initial insight um, and the path of transformation, that kind of process of aligning ourselves with that insight. Um, yeah. 
And when I say sort of aligning, it's about uh, aligning ourselves in the sense that all the aspects of our life are transformed by that vision. Uh, and of course, um, this isn't a, a sort of perfect, a perfect kind of process. We, we, keep, we keep getting kind of glimpses of the vision. Don't we? we we use that as the inspiration to uh, transform and, and, and uh, deepen our practice. So anyway, let's get on to the path, the, the, this path of transformation. And the question is, how do we bring about it? And uh, the first, the first aspect of this, this transformation is. Um, what we call perfect emotion. And often, I, I found this confusing for years actually, because I would keep reading other sources and it would be, and it would be called like um, right intention or right resolve. And, um, but, but Sangha actually translates it as emotion. And the, the reason he uses the word emotion is because this really is about kind of transforming our whole kind of emotional nature. It, it, it goes sort of far beyond, um, yeah, ju just our intentions. It, it's about sort of harmonizing the whole of our emotional and sort of volitional side of our being and bringing that into um, line with the kind of vision we've had, with that kind of vision of the, 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 the nature of existence. Uh, yeah. And, um, there's a reason why uh, perfect emotion sort of sits where it does on, the, on this uh, on the eightfold path between uh, perfect vision and um, the ethical aspects of the path, uh, which are concerned with actions of body, speech, and mind, which we'll, we'll come on to in um, in the next few weeks, and. The reason, the reason for that is that, um, in a way, our emotions and our intentions are what drive our actions. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's our emotions that drive our actions of body, speech and mind. And similarly, uh, our actions kind of come from our emotions and our intentions, don't they? And also, our emotions are closely linked um, with our views. So in a way we could say that um, perfect emotion is the kind of bridge that connects the vision that we have with our actions. Uh, it, it's what kind of links the two. And um, in a way, I, you know, for me, I always, I, I always think, um, it, it's such a sort of fundamental aspect of our practice. And uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about why it's so important. And um, Sang Sangharachita, he says that for most of us, the central problem of the spiritual life is to find emotional equivalence for our intellectual understanding. So yeah, so I'll just, I'll just say that one more time. So for most of us, the central problem of the spiritual life is to find emotional equivalence for our intellectual understanding. And I guess when we think about this, this is obvious, isn't it? I mean, we know, we, we all know plenty about the Dharma. We, we all, um, yeah, we, we all know plenty about it. Um, but actually, uh, how connected are our hearts? to our ideals or, or, or to the vision we had. Uh, and um, yeah, we, 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 all, we all know a lot, don't we? We all know a lot intellectually, but how much of it are we actually able to put in practice? And there's this, there's often this kind of gulf between our, our kind of understanding, our kind of intellectual understanding and our practice. And uh, I'm going to read a quote of Bantes, but he, there's this great, he, he talks about it in this very dramatic fashion. He talks of um, this tremendous, this terrible disparity between understanding and, and, and practice. And I, I just really like, like that. 
he says, um, and, we, and we may say that this is not exceptional. We may say that all religious people find themselves at some point or other, and sometimes even for years together, in this quite terrible and tragic predicament. They know the truth rationally. They know it from A to Z and from Z back to A. They can talk about it. They can write books about it. They can give lectures about it, but they are unable to put it into practice. And this can be for those who are sincere, the source of great suffering. So this really brings us to one of the sort of key aspects of um, perfect emotion, and that is the, uh, the issue of reason and emotion. Um, yeah, and mu much of our knowledge is, of, of, is often conceptual. You know, we know it in the rational mind, we know it in the conscious mind. Uh, and, 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 and having an awareness of this distinction is in, in important in terms of, um, sort of developing uh, perfect emotion. Yeah, because of course, uh, while we know things with the unconscious, um, uh, what a, it, it raises the question about what about the unconscious? What about all our volitions, our emotions and our instincts that lie buried deep within our, um, that lie kind of buried deep within our kind of unconscious mind? And because they all need to be brought along um, they all need to be brought along on the journey, actually. And, and uh, Sangha actually says there's, uh, there's really no spiritual life until the heart is involved. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it just gives a sense of the importance of fully engaging our emotions. Uh, and in a way, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, we know that, that our you know, we, we, we talk, we, you know, we talk a lot about the kind of theory, but at some level, you know, this is, we, we know, don't we, that this is very much a path that we experience. Uh, it's a very kind of experiential thing. Uh, yeah. So we, we, we have this uh, um, tendency to over-associate the rational, the mind and the intellect. And I, and I think that can be a good kind of question to ask ourselves. Do we over associate, you know, do we over associate with our mind and the kind of rational aspects uh, of our life or, 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 or the Dharma? Uh, and in a way, um, as the mystery of the Dharma unfolds, in a way it becomes less and less kind of rational as a kind of mystery that opens up. So I just want to talk um, about a couple of aspects of um, perfect emotion. One, one is around um, integration. So, so much of what drives us is unconscious and we, you know, we just aren't aware of it. Uh, yeah. Um, and often we are just driven by instincts and kind of volitions that um, sit um, within our unconscious. And of course, we also have different aspects to our psyche. Uh, you know, they, very often we'll, we'll experience part of ourselves that very much wants to engage in the spiritual life. But they'll all, you know, they'll also be part of us that um, wants to be on the beach or in the pub or you know where, where, wherever. Um, so in a way, we can be quite kind of disparate beings, different parts of us wanting different things. And another aspect is that our thoughts and, emo and our emotions are often integrated. The mind wants one thing, or the mind thinks one thing, and our emotions tell us something else. Uh, and I guess the classic example of this is something like um, death, isn't it? You know, we all, you know, the mind is, the mind is perfectly aware of it, but somehow at an emotional level, um, we, we struggle to engage with it. Uh, yeah. And of course, um, we can't really transform our emotional side through, um, through the intellect. Uh, we need to integrate ourselves. And uh, this involves bringing um, are what, what sits in our unconscious 
in, uh, in our unconscious, into the conscious. And uh, also bringing together the different aspects um, of our kind of psyche of personality. And also uh, bringing together, uh, kind of closing the gap between uh, our thoughts and our emotions. And we, we, we talk, um, we talk about this process of bringing together the different aspects of ourselves as kind of horizontal integration. So we become more and more of a kind of single and, well, a kind of, we, there's a kind of process of unification and we become more and more of a kind of whole person. And then we, all, we also talk um, about what we call vertical integration and um, yeah so in essence um, what this means is that there is a lot more to us than we likely imagine and um, this is an another uh, Bante quote and I might be slightly paraphrasing it because I'm, I'm not sure the source of it but he says we are both far better and far worse than we think we are so we we have these um, we have these great kind of heights and, and and depths as well, and they largely remain um, they largely remain kind of uncharted. And I think also we we have this we we are deeply kind of innately spiritual beings, and uh, we we have this great capacity for good, and um, we 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 need to kind of um, uh, we, we need to get in touch with that and integrate that into our being. I'm just going to short, I'm just going to share a very short Ryokin poem that um, always reminds me of integration. So hopefully uh, um, the slide will pop up. Yeah, so th this is from Ryokin. So Buddha is your mind and the way goes nowhere. Don't look for anything but this. If you point your cart north when you want to go south, how will you arrive? And um, thanks, Leonardo. I just, I just really like, I really like um, the, the last lines in that. If you, if you point your cart north when you want to go south, how will you arrive? It's like um, we're, we're kind of generally pointing in the wrong direction. Then we have this kind of vision, but but actually we're just we're just looking in the in, in yeah we we're just looking uh, in a different direction. So I'm just going to talk, say a couple of things about uh, the, the the Buddha talked about perfect emotion in terms of three sets of um, three sets of emotion, um, each of which has a kind of negative and a positive, uh, and each which also represents a kind of movement away from a wrong emotion. So hopefully another another slide will 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 pop up. So uh, yeah, the, 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 this is one way that the Buddha talked about um, talked about perfect emotion. So uh, on the right hand side, we've got, we've got the wrong emotion, what we, we, we're trying to move away from, desire, ill will and harmfulness. And on the other side, uh, there's two aspects. So we, 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 so taking the first one as an example, we, we're moving towards generosity and uh, there also needs to be a sense of moving away so there's a kind of giving up and then secondly um, we're moving away from ill will or hate towards uh, non-hate and there's a kind of also a kind of corresponding movement towards meta and then finally we're moving away from causing harm so again there's um that's the that's the negative that's the wrong emotion and then we are uh, moving away from cruelty and developing uh, the positive aspect which is uh, compassion or karana so 
thanks to Inaga. So I'll just touch on these very briefly. I'm slightly conscious of time. Uh, yeah, so with regards to that first pair, um, that kind of sense of giving up and a moving towards generosity, this is um, uh, a way of working with uh, craving or desire. And the more strongly uh, that perfect vision arises, the more likely we are to see the things of the world as being limited. Uh, yeah, we just see the material world in a different way. Um, it has its attractions, but I guess we see more clearly its limitations. Uh, and we see the limitations compared with the vision, really. I think, I think that's the, with, with, with the sort of sense of the transcendental that we, we, we've had a, um, a sense of. So we become less attached to the material world um, and, and, and to sense desire, actually. So there's a kind of process of giving up and moving away from always wanting more. And in a way, this is a, this is a very natural process. Uh, and as, as we become less attached, we become freer with things, we become more willing to give, and there's a movement towards um, generosity. And there's also, I think, uh, an aspect of this about wanting to give, an attitude around finding enjoyment in dana and generosity. Uh, yeah, and there's a Walt Whitman quote, which I, which I always like when he says, uh, Behold, I do not give lectures or a little charity. When I give, I give myself. And uh, I, 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 just, I just like that. It, it has a real sense, doesn't it, of the kind of the, 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 the spirit of Dharma, um, our capacity for, for generosity. Yeah. So I guess that, that's a good question we can ask ourselves, isn't it? Is, um, yeah, our, what are we moving away from? Uh, is our life becoming simpler and are we becoming more generous? And then the, the, the second pair is uh, uh, around non-hate and metta. So there's um, a movement away from ill will. And ill will is, ill will is often a kind of uh, a function of craving. It's a sort of frustrated craving. Um, yeah. So as we, as we see the vision more clearly, we move away from um, ill will towards metta. And then finally, um, uh, we, we, culti we, we, we move away from harming. Uh, and in a way, this, could, this is the sort of fundamental Buddhist, uh, uh, it's the kind of basis of our precepts, isn't it? Is that we move towards non-harm. And of course, uh, we may think, um, yeah, so in its negative uh, form, this, this is about cultivating non-cruelty. And cruelty is a very kind of emotive word, isn't it? And we, we, we may think we would never deliberately inflict pain or suffering on another. Yeah, we might, we might think we're immune from doing that. But of course, cruelty, um, cruelty comes in many ways, doesn't it? It comes through uh, acts of speech, or it can come through lack of action, uh, through neglect, you know, or it comes in more subtle ways uh, in terms of our sort of patterns of consumption and how we consume things and exploit others. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we develop this, um, we develop this um, sense of uh, non-harm and we move towards karana and compassion. Uh, and of course, there's lots of, so this was one way that the Buddha described looking at developing positive emotion, but of course, there's many other qualities, aren't there? There's the, uh, uh, the, the, the other qualities associated with the Brahma Bahamas, like Mudita, 
such as joy in others' well-being, uh, and also faith and um, yeah, faith in our practice and on the, in the path, and also um, emotions such as gratitude. 